Welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we sit down with individuals who are excelling and inspiring in the wide world of endurance sports. Today on the podcast, we have Dr. Michael Grandner. Well, Dr. Grandner is a licensed clinical psychologist. He's a board certified in behavioral sleep medicine and is associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the College of Medicine at the University of Arizona. And uh, works frequently with athletic organizations such as the NCAA, MLB, Team USA, and the IOC. And what we talked about with uh, Michael right before we started is that we could have gone on and on. His list of accomplishments and partnerships is profound. So uh, welcome, Michael. We're so thrilled to have you here. No, I'm glad to be here talking about sleep health. Yes. Um, so before we dive in, um, just to make sure that everyone and all of our listeners are on the same page in terms of sleep, can you explain the importance of sleep for athletes and how it would directly impact their performance? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, sleep is a biological requirement for our body to function. Uh, we need sleep. We don't sleep because we just enjoy it and that it makes us feel good. We sleep because we're required to. It, it, it's part of how we're built. We sleep for the same reason we breathe. Um, and that's why it touches so many different systems. It's part of how we're built foundationally. And so when we're not sleeping well, uh, it can impact everything from our immune system to strength and speed and brain and skin and metabolism, you know, pick a system, I can probably show you how it's sleep related in some way, because sleep plays so many regulatory functions in our body, just foundationally. Hmm. And so we have a lot of athletes that listen to this podcast. Is there any difference between non athletes and athletes in terms of sleep requirements? That's a great question. Um, the answer is sort of yes with an asterisk. Um, the asterisk is, first of all, one of the biggest differences, the, the biggest factors that drive sleep requirements is actually age. A lot of elite athletes tend to be on the younger side. I mean, when I'm working with the, with with Olympians or NCAA athletes or even pro athletes, a lot of them are not older adults. And the younger you are, the more sleep you need. That's irrespective of athlete status, where... Um, you know, teenagers actually probably need more like eight to 10, at least more like a, more like a nine hour sleeper as a teenager, someone who's in their early twenties might really need eight to nine, at least for optimal functioning, even if they're not an athlete. Um, and, and that's a lot of peak years for, for athletic, uh, um, performance. And then as people get older, it's balancing out more toward the seven. Um, but then the question is, do athletes need more sleep? I think um, a lot of athletes need more sleep than they're getting. I don't think that um, they need to worry too much if they're if they're getting the recommended seven to eight hours of sleep um, on a on a general basis. I think their body's probably getting pretty much what they need. However, sleep is where a lot of the recovery and rebuilding happens. I mean, when you're when you're training, what you're doing is you're putting your body through a bunch of stuff. And the idea is your body is supposed to grow back bigger and stronger. When do you think that happens? Actually, you pretty much only secrete growth hormone when you're asleep. And it's actually one particular stage of sleep. So, so sleep is important for that. Do you need more of it? You know, you might need a little more recovery time. Uh, if you think you do, it's an easy experiment to do. Schedule a little bit more time. See if you fill it with sleep. See if you feel better. And then you'll know. Um, it, it's it's not easy to predict. I think most people, if they're getting the seven to eight hours, they're probably fine. You don't have to stress about needing an exorbitant amount, I don't think. So we took a bit of a different route on this one and actually opted because we had put it out to our audience that we yeah. were going to do on the podcast. So we got probably the most amount of questions back <laughs> we've ever received. So clearly this is a topic people are very passionate about and it's pretty cool we got questions from professional runners professional triathletes professional cross awesome. a number of recreational or high performance age groupers as well so we're just essentially going to let those questions guide the yeah so th th throw them out at me and i'll hit them back i love it so we talked a little bit about the hours but is there uh such thing as too much sleep that's a great question. There's there's such a thing as too much anything. You can drink too much water. You can exercise too much. You can 
you know, you, you can do anything too much. Um, there is a limiting factor where most people will wake up. But I mean, I think most people have had this experience at least once in their life where they oversleep and they wake up feeling groggy and a little out of it. Yeah, there is such a thing as too much. So if you, it, it's just, that's unusual in our society, especially, you know, the industrial revolution did a number on our sleep. And so there's very few people who are getting too much sleep on a regular basis. It's just, if you're sleeping nine, 10 hours, and you're feeling really groggy, I, I think I think you might want to ask some questions. That that speaks to this issue that sleep is multidimensional. Sleep isn't just about amount. It's like nutrition that way. It's not just about did I consume enough calories to give my body the energy it needs. There's also the nutrition in there. So for sleep, what you want to think about is duration, but you also want to think about quality. You want to think about timing. You want to think about regularity, and you want to think about daytime sleepiness. So Let's say you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep, but you feel like it's not enough. And then you try sleeping more, but you still feel like it's not enough. Maybe the issue isn't duration. Maybe the sleep you're getting is poor quality and shallow. And so it'll never be enough because it's not it's not good quality. The most common causes of this, by the way, uh, underdiagnosed or undertreated sleep apnea, uh, chronic pain, which is really common in athletes. A lot of athletes are walking around like veterans with, with pain a lot. Sometimes they don't even pay so much attention to it, but they put their body through a lot and that pain can make sleep shallow. Um, all kind of uh, being in a noisy environment, having a snoring spouse, all these things can sort of make your sleep shallow. So you'll wake up feeling not as rested thinking maybe I need more, but it might not be about quantity. It might be about quality. Very interesting. And another question we got was if you have maybe a time coming up that you know you're going to have limited sleep coming up, maybe there's a race or you're just maybe going to have a night out with some friends and get a bit less sleep. Can you bank sleep? Yes, um, that is a very common practice, especially among athletes. But any kind of elite performer, it's, it's something we recommend. Think of it this way. If you're if you're standing and you're going to get knocked into uh, something is going to happen to disrupt your equilibrium. Um, if you're standing in a place of strength and balance, you might get pushed over, but you'll get back up really quickly or, or you'll be less likely to fall over in the first place. As opposed to like if you can barely find your footing and you're barely hanging in there, someone can just tap you and you fall right over. Same thing with sleep. There is data that shows that if if you're if you're coming from a place of strength, if you're well rested, your your body is is in balance, in equilibrium, and then you have a disruption, it's actually not that big of a deal. After one, the, the good and bad news is sleep deprivation effects on performance are cumulative, um, so they'll get worse and worse over time. But what that means is if you're if you're sleeping fine and well rested and you have a couple nights of bad sleep, you're not going to be that impaired. And actually, that's what I tell a lot of athletes. So if you're in the Olympic Village and you're sleeping fine, something's wrong with you. Right. Like that, that's really unusual. I mean, the thing is, get as much good sleep as you can up until those couple days before you're performing. Then, yeah, you're going to have a rough couple days, but you're approaching it from a straight place of strength and balance and you'll be less likely to be impaired. You're going to be more likely to psych yourself out in terms of your performance than your actual impairment. Um, unless it's really extreme. If you're knocked down to like two to four hours, you're, you're going to be more impaired right off the bat. But like five, six hours, you know, for a couple nights in a row where your sleep's a little more choppy, um, especially in that case, it's going to be a few days before those impairments really start mounting. I think they'll be very pleased with that because that is counter to some of the things that you hear. So it's yeah. just good. Yeah, I mean, like, but when you think about it this way, evolution figured this out a long time ago, yeah. that if sleep had to be perfect all the time for us to like not die, we wouldn't have made it this far. Like <laughs> our ancestors, like we had, sleep is very, sleep is like nutrition that way. You don't have to have an absolutely perfect diet to have a healthy diet and be fine. You can potentially optimize and make things better, but you know, there's a, you get diminishing returns after a certain point, you know, where it's not as big of a deal. If your diet is generally good, same thing with sleep. It's built to be resilient. It's built to be a little bit flexible. You just want to do what you can when you can so that your body's adaptability and resilience 
can take over when you can't. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Uh, you talked a lot about like the quality. So we yeah. actually got a number of questions around sleep quality. Okay, let's uh, talk about one it. Was, how do I stay asleep? And then they added, I always wake up when my husband comes to bed later than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so the how do I stay asleep? This is a fascinating question. And I've got an answer that I think a lot of people aren't going to expect. The answer is you're not going to. No one ever has. The typical adult wakes up 10 to 20 times a night. They oh. just don't remember. Uh, again, evolution figured this out a long time ago. You'll, you, if you actually track physiologically when people are awake or asleep, you'll see that there's lots of these small awakenings across the night. Um, you know, you can, you get maybe they had to do with vulnerability and like you wake up in the middle of the night, no bear, go back to sleep and you have no memory of it. You have no memory of an awakening that lasts less than two to three minutes. Um, when do these events happen? They happen at stage transitions. So you have these sleep cycles, you drop down into deep sleep, come up into REM, and then go, you know, you have these cycles across the night. At the transition points where you're either coming out of deep sleep or dropping back down in from REM and out of REM sleep, that's times when there's lots of these sort of awakenings. They naturally occur that way. That the awakening occurred is not the problem. Of course you woke up then, everyone has, you always have, so does everybody else. That's not the awakening that's the problem. It's why do you remember that awakening? Why was it not 30 seconds to a minute and then you go back to sleep? What was there? So a couple of things can be happening. One could be that um, people who are carrying around a lot of stress, the stress isn't waking you up. It's that as soon as you're conscious, your stress has been waiting for your attention. Um, or pain or other some other sort of discomfort or activation. You're like, shoot, I'm awake. Um, and I'll get to this in a second, but sometimes just the, 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 the awakening can trigger more activation. So it's the activation that's a problem. So um, I'll talk in a minute about how to prevent it. But um, the thing I want to talk about here is, is a thing called conditioned arousal. This is the number one cause of insomnia. Um, there are a million things that can cause short-term insomnia. Anything can cause short-term insomnia, but there's only one main cause of chronic insomnia, and that's conditioned arousal. That's when you sleep being difficult, whether it's falling asleep or resuming sleep, when that becomes predictable, subconsciously, doesn't have to be consciously predictable. It could just be like your brain's not an idiot. It's a pattern recognition machine. When you feed it that pattern where waking up in the middle of the night becomes predictably tied with staying awake, every time you wake up without even thinking, your brain's like, am I going to fall back asleep or am I not? Um, as soon as that prediction becomes plausible, that creates activation in and of itself. So when sleep becomes predictably stressful, that predictable stress becomes the very activation that keeps it going and it becomes a snowball and that's how chronic insomnia develops so so for that person why do i wake up in the middle of the night you wake up because everyone wakes up but that wasn't the question the question is why do i stay awake well either you have some sort of background activation that's creating a barrier to resuming sleep um, in which case we you can deal with that um, and I can and, and I can talk about how um, or you have a conditioned arousal that you're just so used to waking up when you wake up, you're like, oh, here I go again. And that thought process becomes the stress that ends up keeping you up. So we have to deprogram that. And, and that's where that's what we do that in clinic all the time. Um, one of the reasons it happens at certain times in the night, the times it's most common is in the second half of the night, because your sleep pressure, your hunger for sleep dissipates across the night. By the time you're halfway into the night, you've lost more than three quarters of your sleep pressure. So you don't have as much, um, you don't have as much of a drive to get back to sleep. So it might require some time. And so if you, and, and this is going to be universal advice. If you wake up, whether you're trying to fall asleep or it's during the middle of the night, or it's at the end of the night, and it's an hour before your alarm's going off, but you're not going to get back to sleep. If you're in bed and sleep is not imminent, just get up. If you're not going to be able to sleep anyway, the best thing you can do is get out of bed. And I know people have kind of heard this and it sort of doesn't make sense that it's counterintuitive. Um, getting out of bed won't help you fall asleep faster. It will prevent conditioned arousal associated with the bed. If you're, if you're going to have that activation anyway, if you can't control it, at least get it out of bed. Um, 
so it's a lot of times so so a lot of times what happens is you have something that causes that awakening so i talked about sleep apnea a lot of people have undiagnosed sleep apnea where a respiratory event causes an awakening you don't even know you had a respiratory event all you know is the way it shows up in clinic is i was asleep and then i was awake for no apparent reason but i was wide awake and i couldn't get back to sleep and i might have been stressed or I felt a little stressed or activated, like I just got shot with adrenaline or something, but I don't know why. It's because you just had a respiratory event. You just don't know it. You had an apnea or a hypopnea or something that woke you up. And, and your body's activated. And it's like a wave. It's got to pass on its own. You just got shot with adrenaline. you got to wait for it to clear out of your system. You are not going to fall. There's nothing you can do to make sleep more imminent. So just get up. What you don't want to do is lay in bed. And as the activation is reducing, you start getting frustrated that you're not falling asleep. So now you've replaced one activation with another. Now you're frustrated. That frustration is now what keeps you awake. And you've actually prolonged it by staying in bed. So getting up is better in that situation. I'm so, sorry for the long-winded answer, but it's actually, there's, there's a lot of reasons people wake up during the night. And I would say when you wake up during the night, think, can I fall back to sleep? That I woke up, who cares? Everyone wakes up. Don't freak out about it. Just say, is there some, Is there an activation that's preventing me from going back to sleep? If not, I'm going to need to take a break and get out. If not, just go back to sleep. Don't worry about it. I think you answered like almost the other two. The others were like <laughs> pulling back to sleep after waking up. And I guess the answer is, you know, if you're not going to get out of bed, you um, right. did touch on insomnia, which was, you know, recommendations on dealing with it. I think it goes back to get out of bed and it's much more complex, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing with, with, with insomnia is the, so short term insomnia, anything can cause it. And the data show we just had another paper published on this following people who go from good sleep to short term insomnia to chronic. And basically lots of people get short term insomnia it usually resolves on its own. The time it doesn't is when people stay in bed and fight it. Because the I, I have to attribute this to, to Lindsay Shaw, who's a colleague of mine. She's another brilliant sleep person and does a lot of work with athletes. Um, and athletes like, like controlling lots of things. They want to optimize. And one of the things she tells them is, sleep isn't something you do. Sleep is something that happens to you when the situation allows for it. If you're not able to sleep, and you can control the situation in such a way that it will allow sleep to happen. Do it. Do that meditation. Get the drink of water. Whatever it is you need to do, do the thing that can change. Turn off the light, you know, roll your spouse over, whatever it is. If there is nothing you can do to change the situation to allow for it to sleep, if it's an internal activation or whatever, you can't control that. It's out of your control. So, Sleep isn't going to happen. You have to wait until you're in control again. You have to let it go. Um, the other thing that she says is uh, nobody got to sleep faster by trying harder. Um, it doesn't work that way. So it just backfires. You're adding energy into the system instead of taking energy out of the system. And sometimes that surrender of control is really hard for athletes to do. But it, it sometimes if, if that's where you're trying to go, you can't force it. You actually have to let it go or else it's not, or else forcing is just going to make it worse. Wow. So much good stuff here. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Next topic. Uh, we got a number of questions on is one that I'm definitely passionate about and I enjoy, and that's around napping. So oh, napping's before great. Before we get into the questions, what, uh, like, what is your philosophy on napping and are you, yeah. it is an effective piece for athletes or just like individuals running at a, high pace every day yeah napping is great i mean think of so so people get very confused about napping because it's like are naps good or bad naps naps aren't good or bad they just are there think of a nap like a snack is a snack good or bad well good. it depends <laughs> like how big is your snack how calorie dense is your snack what time are you snacking how much are you snacking what are you snacking on it all depends like a handful of 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 like nuts and dried fruit in the middle of the day gets you a little bit of carbs some sugar and some protein can help you with your energy and your focus during the day can help stave off overeating later by by preventing you from getting too like all these good things but you know 
Sure. If you looked at the correlation of how often people snack and how it's related to metabolism, you might find the opposite direction, that people who snack more gain more weight. Well, it's because they're snacking more and, and maybe they're not snacking healthily. So that's the thing with napping. A nap by choice, generally in the middle of the day, not close to bedtime, um, can be great. It can improve reaction time, focus, reduce fatigue, improve learning, improve memory. It's great. It's a great little sleep snack. But people who are who can't stay awake during the day and they're napping because they're exhausted, it's like people snacking all day because they're starving all the time. What's up with your diet that you're always hungry? Why are you always hungry? What's going on with your metabolism? That's, that's the thing with napping. Um, napping isn't good or bad. It's, are you doing it by choice and what are you doing it for? Are you napping to, to boost your performance or are you napping because you cannot maintain your consciousness? Like that's a sign that something's up. Um, so yeah, I, I, I often suggest napping for athletes who want to perform, especially, you know, a lot of the pro athletes where their performance is outside of the natural peak that we have. It's usually they have to perform later than your, their bodies actually really want to. So sometimes a nap is a great way to reduce some of their natural sleep drive by by feeding by satiating a little bit of that sleep drive to to improve some of that performance a little bit later can i um i know we want to get into the questions but one of the podcasts <laughs> that I'm listening to with you um and i'm gonna butcher it so i'm gonna defer okay. it to make it better but you bring daytime sleepiness and that indicator of uh you were talking about it being like an almost like enhance performance enhancing drug in terms of sleep um yeah. and talking about daytime sleepiness as an indicator of whether or not athletes were going to stay on and i think it was in football yeah no no this is, this is baseball i gotta give credit to to ben Patenziano. <laughs> so he did this study um i love it i i cite it all the time it was very simple where where it was done with with chris winter uh, when he was working with chris winter they did this survey of of MLB players um, across a few different teams. And they gave them an eight item. It's a, it's called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. It's a standard. We use it in clinic all the time. And um, basically they looked at the score. It's a measure of how likely are you to fall asleep in, in a handful of different regular situations. And when you map out the score um, against, and then they followed people up about two years later, see if they were still in the major leagues, each point increase on the scale increase the likelihood that that person was no longer in the major leagues um, with with the people who are in the clinical range of, of 11 or higher 75 percent of them were no longer in the majors for one reason or another and so what, sleepy players don't last um, it's a sign that something's wrong if you can't stay awake it's like it's like the 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 stereotypical sleepy teens that who can't stay awake in school like that's a problem they can't learn they can't function. They're more likely to have like daytime sleepiness is correlated with errors and accidents and injuries and, and all this stuff. If you, and it's, and think of it, think of daytime sleepiness as like hunger. If you're always starving everywhere you go, you cannot see a piece of food without eating it. Your body can't see rest without, without falling unconscious. Something's up. Like it's a sign of a problem that that if you're sleeping well at night you know sleep it, it enhances performance better than a lot of a lot of stuff people do to enhance performance same thing with a nap it's it's a very natural performance enhancer it's giving your body the thing it actually uses and 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 wants to enhance its own performance very cool yeah i feel like anecdotally i've had these like dips where i've seen and then i need that like midday nap but then suddenly when my in my sleep increases at night then i'm just like power through the yeah, whole day you don't no need it as much if activity levels up there so that's that's cool to hear yeah i mean and that's the perfect time to nap too i mean again humans figured this out a long time ago it's just the industrial revolution that screwed it all up where we have a work day that starts in the morning and ends at night we're not agrarian anymore so <laughs> like that a dip in the afternoon is normal even for even if you don't fall asleep like having a little bit of a rest time Boost, tends to boost performance. I, I think that this is something that people inherently know. Um, and it's just, am I right? And and I, I guess I'm here to say, yeah, you're actually right. Like we're, we're all right about this. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have, I think Thursday night is the only night we put like a key sort of workout in our schedule. Most of them are in the morning. And that one is like the perfect day for me to just <laughs> like a quick 20 yeah. in the afternoon. What is the optimal nap time? Good good is question. So so there's two kinds of, of naps that you can take by choice. One is is what's you know what a lot of people call a power nap. Um, a power nap is, so when you first fall asleep, you start in a light sleep stage and you drop down into a deep sleep stage. A power nap means you woke up before you dropped down into deep sleep. That could be usually 20 to 40 minutes. Um, you drop into deep sleep maybe between 10 and 20 minutes when you go to bed at night. The further away you are from your regular bedtime, the more time you have before you're going to drop down into deep sleep because it's not your brain's like, oh, this isn't nighttime sleep. It's just a nap. I'm going to stay out of deep sleep for now. That's good. You don't want to drop down to deep sleep. Sounds a little counterintuitive. If that's where a lot of recovery is happening. The problem is anyone who's napped for too long knows what happens when you drop down into deep sleep in a nap. You wake up feeling groggy, exhausted, disoriented, and it can kind of ruin your day sometimes because you weren't supposed to. That was, that was nighttime sleep that you just interrupted. And so you feel crummy, you feel sleep deprived for the rest of your day, um, as opposed to a nap, which is the snack. A snack is not supposed to be a meal. Um, if you wake up before that, you get a lot of the benefits of sleep without taking on the responsibility of having to go through a full cycle. Um, and the amount of time will depend. The more sleep deprived you are, the faster you're gonna drop down into deep sleep any time of day. The closer you are to your regular bedtime, the faster you're gonna get into deep sleep. You know, so that's why a nap in the middle of the day, 20 to 40 minutes, is usually just fine. The amount of time doesn't seem to matter too much. Um, it's more about, about that you didn't wait too long. Now, the alternative is like the college student nap of sleeping for like three hours in the middle of the day. I call that a sleep replacement nap. It's kind of like a meal replacement shake where like you look at it, no one's going to say that that looks like a meal, but it'll still do the trick in a pinch. And so that it, it's, it's, it is real sleep. You do get a full cycle, but you got to budget enough time for it. Um, and so like, if you have to stay up really late or, or your, 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 your schedule doesn't, it's just like you're a shift worker and you need to get sleep during the day. You can sleep during the day. It just, it takes a little longer to make it through that cycle. Cause that slope into deep sleep is slowed down and you got to wait till you get all the way through. But you can, and, and it does count the same as nighttime sleep, more or less. I think you answered all of the nap questions, and I can tell each <laughs> one of these could be a full episode. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> it's fun. I mean, the, the great thing about sleep is that, like, we're born with it. It's, it's, it's our sleep is our friend. Sleep is our ally. Sleep is there to help us perform better. Sleep is there to help us. And, and you know, in the, if I were in the diet world, my job would be harder because, you know, the, the problem with nutrition is we live in a world that we weren't built for in such a way that that our body is built to want the things we now get too much access to. With sleep, it's kind of the opposite. By getting people sleep, actually, we're giving the body more of what it wants, mm -hmm. as opposed to industrialization, which kind of took it away for a while, for a generation or five, you know, and now we're now we're sort of rediscovering uh, maybe, maybe this was, this was good for society for a while that got us where we're at, but do we need to keep doing it this way? And, and we're rediscovering that at what being rested actually feels like. Yeah. And I love the comparison that you've get, given between like nutrition and sleep. Like, I think that that's such like an easy way for people yeah. to make that link. Yeah. When, when people can't sleep, it's like, it's like when people say like, I'm having trouble breathing. When people say, because because you're built to do it, like you've been doing it since you were born, so has every human ever, every day. Like it's not it's not like a skill you had to pick up. And so when people say I can't sleep, it to me it sounds like I can't breathe. And when someone has goes into the doctor and, and has trouble breathing, it's not just because they stink at breathing. Like oh, I'm just bad at it. I've always sucked at breathing. Like that's not true. It means that there's there's something that's preventing your body from doing the thing it's built to do naturally. Is it, is it like air quality? Is it lung, your lungs? Is it your airway inflammation? 
what is it that's preventing your body from doing the thing it naturally is able to do? Same thing with sleep. Usually with sleep problems, it's not just like I just stink at sleeping. It's what's preventing you from, from being able to sleep the way your body is built to, because it is built to do it. What's in the way? And let's figure out if we can remove those barriers. And that makes perfect sense. And with the questions that we received, yeah. beyond just the sleep quality and how much you need in the napping, you're dealing with athletes. So we got a ton about supplements. So oh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about supplements. <laughs> so I'm going to transition us to our, our long list of supplement where we've, we've broken it down into sort of okay. three. The first is, well, like, do supplements work or are they BS? And which ones are worth the investment and which ones to avoid? And the reason that they're asking yeah. is in the context of sleep. Um, right. So there's really, there's really two ways to think about sleep supplements. One is the way people tend to think about them as, as um, parallel to sort of like sleeping pills and sleep medication, where it's like stuff to take to make more sleep gooder. You know, it's like, to, to, <laughs> like, and so it's like sleep, like adding, like boosting sleep signal. Um, do they work? With the caveat of what is a dietary supplement, a dietary supplement, what's the difference between a supplement and a medicine? Um, it's that if if something is intended to fix a problem, it is required to be a medicine and pass certain tests and certain things. If it does that, then it's a medicine. If it doesn't do that, a supplement is something that boosts your natural ability to, to, to be healthy without necessarily fixing a problem. So like a supplement can't say, we'll lower your blood pressure. A supplement could say something like improve heart health. Now to most people, that's maybe a distinction without a difference, but but to a scientist, to someone, to, to the, the words actually make a big difference. So taking something that boosts heart health, if it changes your blood pressure by zero, it's still doing its job and its claims are true if it's doing something that supports heart health in some way. If you're expecting it to lower your blood pressure, you're doing it wrong. You should be taking blood pressure medication for that. That's If, if it worked to lower blood pressure, so like if any supplement worked to, to fix insomnia, that company would patent it as a drug and sell it. You'd make more money that way. So, so supplements don't fix insomnia. They can help you sleep better. Uh, and they'll do so in a few different ways. Um, I'll talk about melatonin last because it's way weirder than people think. Um, <laughs> there are things that are slightly sedative that sort of calm you down that have calming properties um, that, and even potentially sleep boosting properties like valerian um, and and things that are calming like, like L-theanine and magnesium. Um, a lot of these things work by, by improving sort of this calming signal. For some people, that's an important barrier to sleep and, and, and helping you feel more calm and relaxed at night could help with sleep. Um, versus placebo, they tend not to do very much in people who have insomnia. If you have insomnia, get it treated. Um, and, and I'll say, if you have insomnia and you're afraid of sleeping pills, actually sleeping pills are not the recommended treatment for insomnia. They're just the most common one. Uh, they're the easiest to write prescriptions for. If you look at any medical organization that has a recommendation for how to fix insomnia, evaluating everything that's ever been on the market and existed, they all say, number one, far and away, it's cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, CBTI, um, which doesn't have the problems and performance impairing problems that most sleeping pills have. Um, it's just a lot of people don't know about it. You could seek it out. We could talk about that later if you want. But um, supplements, back to supplements. Some of them are calming and sedating. Like, Magnesium. People who take magnesium, uh, there's a few studies out there that show, yes, they'll fall asleep faster, they'll sleep more during the night, they'll even have more deep sleep. If you if 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 you looked at all the advertising for magnesium, supports deep sleep, improves deep sleep, if you actually look at the study, it added about a few minutes, less than five minutes from about uh, of deep sleep to someone's night. Is that really worth all of that marketing for, for two to six minutes? Like, I don't really know. I think it's about two minutes added to deep sleep. Like, did that make a big difference? I don't know. Um, if you want to say like, oh, I have terrible deep sleep, but if I take magnesium, it'll fix it. Chances are that's not what's going to happen, but it could help. Um, 
Other things that help with sleep are actually things that reduce pain and inflammation because your body's healing and recovering during the night. So you have things that have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. You take them at night, they might help you with sleep because they might be insulating your sleep from that pain and, and inflammation that could be waking you up and, and can help with the recovery process. Um, so, so those things can help. People who take them often say they sleep a little bit better but it, they almost rarely and almost never fix an insomnia problem. Then there's melatonin. Melatonin does not work the way most people think it does. Melatonin is not a sedative. It has no sedating properties to it at all. Um, if you, it, it tells your body it's nighttime. It's a nighttime signal. If you give melatonin to a nocturnal animal, it wakes them up because it's a nighttime signal. It's not a sleep signal. It's only a sleep signal in that how your body interprets a nighttime signal. So for example, um, if you have, this is also why it almost never works to treat insomnia, because if you have insomnia, usually your body knows it's nighttime and you still can't sleep. Telling your body it's nighttime in just in all caps and louder by taking extra melatonin doesn't help. It just, you know, it just makes you feel even more uncomfortable sometimes. So um, what melatonin does with the nighttime signal the reason it was discovered as a treatment is um, blind people. So we have we have our natural 24 hour rhythms that control all this stuff in our body. And we secrete melatonin at night and we start it in the evening, peaks at night, drops right around the time we want to wake up. Um, and it's a roughly 24 hour cycle. Um, it's not exactly 24 hours, but we need to stay on a 24 hour day. So we've evolved to use light to suppress melatonin. Light suppresses melatonin. Uh, and we use light to tell what time it is. And so our melatonin rhythm aligns to light patterns. Blind people, if they can't see, they're just using their internal melatonin and they start drifting off of 24 hours because it's imprecise. A half a milligram of melatonin in the evening completely, or less, maybe a third of a milligram, um, com can completely fix the rhythms in a blind person, can, can send that signal at the right time. That's all they need. It's just a little nudge. That's why higher doses don't work better. It's not dose response. It's, are you giving, are you telling your body it's nighttime, yes or no? And if you take melatonin in the middle of the day, most of the time it won't do anything because your body knows it's not nighttime. Some, I mean, if you, if you take it in the middle of the day and then turn all the lights off and then go into bed, like it might, your body might be confused enough as to whether it's daytime or nighttime where it might help with sleep. But under normal circumstances, you, if you take it during the day, you're not really going to feel super sleepy because uh, your body knows it's daytime. Take it during the night, your body already knows it's nighttime. So like it won't do much. The times when it really works is around that inflection point in the evening. Higher doses don't necessarily work better. Like I said, a half a milligram is all it takes. Uh, if you look at the difference between a half and three, almost no difference except the half might work slightly better, but there's really no difference. Higher doses start, like earlier, actually cause more problems. Um, Taking it closer to bedtime, you might need a little bit higher because you're already sort of producing it. So that's where the five kind of comes in. Um, there's For sleep, there's no reason anyone should be taking 10 or more. That's, you know, it, you might have anti-inflammatory effects. You might have other stuff for melatonin, but 10 for sleep, if you're taking 10 for sleep thinking it's like a stronger dose, it's not. It doesn't work that way. Um, if anything, you'll feel groggier in the morning because you can't metabolize it fast enough. So you're telling your body it's nighttime at night, but then there's still so much of it still floating around in your system by daytime, you're trying to wake up and you can't because your body still thinks it's nighttime or it's getting mixed signals. Yeah. That's why higher doses aren't really recommended. Um, the other thing I should talk about the dosing is any supplement. This is something, this is something I've learned about the supplement industry that a lot of people don't quite understand. Any supplement, um, if they're, if they're a company that's following the rules and the FDA laws, a lot of the smaller ones tend to be fast and loose with the rules. But if they're a good company, they're following the rules. And the rules say that the amount that is on the bottle has to be the amount in the pill at the expiration date. So if you have a bottle with a three-year shelf life and you have an active chemical process where it degrades over time, the, the, the chemists are smart people. They have, to, they have to perform a calculation of how much of an overage do they need to put in the pill so that by the time it reaches the expiration date, it hits the right window that's on the bottle. 
That's why you hear all this stuff about the, the amounts being inaccurate in a lot of these supplements. It's because of the overages that are there on purpose because they're following the law. They were required to be there by law. So that means, so with melatonin, it's usually like 30 to 50% sometimes, depending on, on what the medium. So, you know, if you're buying a five, it's probably more like an eight when it was was just over those. So you could, you could cut the thing in half and a quarter and probably be fine. Um, that's another thing people should know about melatonin. So melatonin can be great. It can, it can boost that sleep signal by boosting that nighttime signal if that's what you need to help you. But if you have insomnia, that's also why it's not really a sedative. And how about CBD and THC? You've got a lot oh, of Canadian yeah. athletes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so CBD and THC. So THC, there's a quite a bit of data on THC. It can help you fall asleep faster, feel more rested. Um, but two things about THC. One, um, there's some evidence that it's a very potent REM suppressor, uh, which may or may not be a good thing. I mean, antidepressants are also potent REM suppressors, and that might be how they work and how they make people feel better. Who knows? Um, but... The, the problem with THC is the sedative effects start wearing off over time. And so people feel like they have to, to keep escalating doses. And so it doesn't seem to be a good long-term solution, um, but the REM suppression doesn't wear off. And so then what happens is when people stop taking it, they get this like flood of crazy dreams and nightmares because of the REM rebound. And then they feel like I have to take it to keep my nightmares away. But actually, no, the nightmares were just a withdrawal symptom. Um, that they would have gone away on their own. And so like, if you're using it long-term, it's probably going to start wearing off after maybe a few weeks. Um, CBD is super murky. Um, there's a bunch of studies on CBD and sleep. Uh, if you pull them all together, it's no different from placebo, but that's because some studies show it works great. Some studies show it actually makes sleep worse. Uh, and most of the studies show that it didn't do anything relative to, to a placebo effect. So it seems to depend on the dose depend on the timing, depend on the person. And the, the the scientific community hasn't quite worked out the kinks in it yet to figure out how to optimize it. So if I have a patient who's on it and they say it's working great for me, I'm not going to say, no, it isn't. Um, but I'm going to say like, well, you know, we'll take what we can get, but let's just not have our hopes super high about it. So and then the other thing for athletes is <laughs> is is cannabinoids do impair performance in other ways, like not just from a sleep perspective, but the, the, the a motivation, sometimes lack of coordination. It might increase injury risk, and that's really bad for athletes. So that, that's the only reason why, like, well, if you're using it for sleep, there's probably something better that's a little safer. Mm -hmm. Oh man, interesting stuff. So next, uh, next topic is a hot one, especially over the last couple of years with the amount of wearables that are coming in from yeah. Common to Whoop to there's, you name it, it's out there now. So what is kind of your philosophy on these like wearables and the, the data? Can we use it? Is it accurate? <laughs> What parts of it are accurate? Where do you come Yeah, from? yeah. So most of the devices are probably fine for sleep versus weight. That technology has been around since the 70s. I mean, it's it's um, whether you're asleep or awake um, is, is probably fine. Some devices seem to be better than others. Um, but if you're using it to just get a general picture of how you're sleeping, note that if it's working correctly, remember I said a typical adult wakes up 10 to 20 times during the night. Like that's actually normal. If your device shows that, it means it's probably working correctly. If your device does not show that, it means it's probably overscoring sleep and missing a lot of the awakenings. Does that matter? Well, if you didn't remember it, if the tree fell in the woods and it didn't make a sound, did it even matter? The question is, is it measuring physiologic sleep versus wake or is it not? Um, and a lot of times, some of the, the, the cheaper or less well-studied devices some of them are expensive and they're still not well studied, um, tend not to have great algorithms for sleep versus weight. Uh, what I'll tell you is the data on Fitbit, Aura, Whoop, um, they're all essentially the same. Um, they're more or less in the same ballpark uh, in that they'll be about 90% accurate on a minute to minute basis versus a sleep lab, not versus a diary. So that's the other thing. If you ask people how much they slept, they don't remember all those awakenings during the night, for example. So the numbers are going to be different. If you ask someone how much did you sleep and they say, I slept eight hours, a wearable might say they slept seven hours. Was the wearable correct and they were wrong? No, you're measuring different things. And for the guidelines, like how much sleep do you need guidelines? Those are based on self-report, not objective devices. 
So if you feel like you slept about seven hours, if you would have said seven hours, but the device said six and a half, am I meeting the recommendations? Yes. That, that's actually a distinction people need to know. So like the device will always be a little less than your recollection. The recommendations are based on the recollection, not on the device. So, but that's how you can know if they're accurate. If it looks like it's supposed to, if it's a little broken up during the night, that's actually correct. Um, sleep stages are different. Sleep stages are ballpark. They're used to, using a combination of movement and heart rate. Do not overinterpret any particular night. They're all sort of fine ballpark, but like, you're you're guessing based what's happening in the cortex based on variability in your in in, in wrist based heart rate. It's always going to be to a certain degree of inaccurate. It's just giving you a general idea of were there lots of stage transitions during the night? Was if is there no deep sleep in here? If not, doesn't mean you weren't getting any. It just means the heart rate patterns it was getting were not consistent with the algorithm for deep sleep. It doesn't mean you weren't getting any. So I would, I would actually, in terms of order of importance, I'd focus on sleep versus wake, like how many, how much sleep did you get and how many awakenings did you have as, as, as mostly reliable on the timing. Then I would look at, um, I, then I would look at sleep stages, but just as sort of an overall picture where you did it, did it look super shallow or not? Did it, does it say you got no REM sleep or no deep sleep? If so, is there some activation going on that's preventing the algorithms from picking it up even if you are getting it? Other than that, don't overinterpret the data. Um, don't, it, it, it's, it's a fuzzy picture. Don't try and read too much into any particular night. Yeah, just thinking about like, I have my Garmin that I wear while I'm sleeping, but it's not showing me waking up 10 times in a night, maybe once or twice, but those are usually ones I remember. So, right. So the, the Garmin, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to call anyone out, but I didn't, I didn't say <laughs> the Garmin was one of the better ones. There's the one study I know of that have looked, that looked at Garmin devices showed that it massively overscored sleep relative to wake, it missed a lot of the wake episodes. Maybe they're better now. I don't know. But that one study, the one that actually had good data on Garmin showed that it was actually not one of the better performers for sleep wake seems to be great for fitness stuff yeah just not as good for sleep wake well yeah you mentioned a couple of the ones that seem to be putting out some of the better data so that's good for uh good for people to know if they're putting some more stock into that yeah um we are doing rapid fire but uh yes we have a hard stop we're gonna finish with a couple more general questions sure sleep apnea right at the beginning how yeah. common is that for athletes sleep apnea is way more common than anyone knows um it's you're i'm talking like maybe one out of four or five men over age 30 and one out of maybe 15 women over age 30 even if you're not even overweight um it's super common um mild sleep apnea is it really that big of a deal medically? It's, it's actually, you don't really worry about it till it's more moderate to severe, except it can impair performance and mood and energy level, even at lower levels. So, you know, when, when an athlete comes in, I've diagnosed sleep apnea in young, healthy, you know, in shape people. You don't have to be an overweight male over 60 to have sleep apnea. That's just, you know, your chances are more than 80% if you're a morbidly obese male over age 60. Like it's just, this is more common. It's, but you can get it as a 20 year old who is in perfect shape. It, it can happen. It's more about airway biology and tonsils and your tongue and all kinds of stuff and genetics. So when, when an athlete comes in and says, my sleep just doesn't feel like I'm recovering well, or I feel like, like it's, it's my, my times are being impacted and I don't know why. Let's take a look. Like it doesn't hurt to test for it and see if it's there. And if it is, we could potentially get it treated and remove that barrier. It's it, it's way more common than people know. There's a bunch of stigma around it with CPAPs and stuff. If it's mild to moderate, you don't even need a CPAP. There's you can put like a mouth guard in at night that can fix it. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. And if it helps you feel way better during the day, might as well. I love that. Now on your website, you um our listeners can sign up. I think you have an ebook or or that like gives like the top like oh yeah, I I have a little free booklet of like what are 10 things that I actually do every day. Um and that's fine. Like I, I'm happy to just give that out to anybody. Um I, I'm not I don't really have anything I'm selling. No I'm just I, an academic. 
<laughs> I was just saying that that is a really great way that ties into the next question. You have some resources on it, but just looking at like nighttime routines that athletes can use and like maybe some of those top sleep hygiene tips. Like one thing I'll yeah. add is like when I go to bed every night, I'm wearing like a hoodie and sweatpants and I got like three blankets <laughs> on me and Mark's like just in his boxers with like nothing. Yep. Like, that, that, that is very much a, women tend to tend to <laughs> run a little colder at night too. Um, I mean, what I would say for nighttime routine, the most important thing I can tell you is a lot of people, like one of that, I've talked about conditioned arousal. One of the things that causes conditioned arousal to take over is when people go to bed before they're ready. And then what happens is they go into bed and they say, I just can't turn my mind off. Well, your mind isn't a piece of electronic equipment that just turns off. When I hear that, I think, well, when, when I hear I'm still in bed, but my mind just keeps going, I hear I'm in my car. I want to stop at this stop sign, but my car just keeps going into the intersection. Eventually stops, but further than I would like, just like with the, with your brain at night. And in that, that case, as I asked the question of how fast were you going, when did you start braking? Um, and, and so they'll say I was going 100 miles an hour and I started braking two millimeters before the stop sign because I had <laughs> stuff to do and I was in a hurry. And I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with your brakes. There's nothing wrong with your car. There's nothing wrong with the intersection. You're still going to get hit because you didn't give yourself enough time and space to wind down. And, and we, you know, we're not machines. We are, we are biological organisms that are with the have inertia. And so if we're going and going and going, we need to give ourselves time to slow down or else we're going to take that time when we're in bed and then you're going to get into bed and your mind's going to be going. And then the next day you're going to get into bed and your mind's still going. And then you're going to get into bed and your mind's still going. You do that enough times, even if you are exhausted and falling asleep on the couch, you get into bed and your mind's like, oh, here's the place where I start thinking and going. And, and the bed becomes the place of activation. And now you've got a conditioned arousal. So you want to make sure you're ready before you get in. Sometimes it's better just delay bedtime until you're, you remember, like, like, like Lindsay says, you, you're not going to fall asleep faster by trying harder. And sleep is not something you can control if the situation doesn't allow for it. Part of the situation is, where is your body? Where is your mind? If it's not, if sleep isn't going to be possible yet, do what you need to do. I, I'm not going to be one of those people that says all screens must go down an hour before bedtime because I'm not an idiot. And, and if I tell people to do that, that's not going to actually happen. But what I will say is, if you're going to be doing some some, some something on screens, make it be something that you're not too emotionally and physically and mentally invested in. If you have to wind down from it, if it if you if you can't separate yourself from it, good rule of thumb is if an alarm goes off right now, could you stop and just put it down and be okay? If the answer is yes, that's probably fine. If the answer is no, 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 five more minutes, it means you're probably too connected to it, and it, and and it's you need you need something else to disengage. That's not the time for that thing. For shows, I mean, it's great. I grew up at a time when there were just a few channels on the television. I'm not, I didn't even feel that old, but like, you know, the fact that everything is now streaming and recording, I get to tell myself, yeah, I want to watch this show, but it will be there tomorrow. And it doesn't care whether I watch it now or not. And it's not going to perceptibly change my life, whether I watch it now or not. Doesn't matter. It'll be there and let it go. Watch something else. Do something else. That's amazing. Well, thank you. Um, do you have any like additional tips in terms of like darkness, temperature, noise? Yeah, I mean, so um, you want it's great to create more of those nighttime dusk dark signals at night, which means dim lights. Um, people hear about blue light. The reason for that is we have these sensors in our eyes that are looking for actually they're looking at around between 450 and 540 nanometers of a frequency, which includes mo pretty much all of blue. And a lot of green too. It's the signal of daytime frequency. That's the color of the sky, the sea, the natural world. And, and evolution discovered this a long time ago. That that's the frequency of, of Earth, of, of daytime. Not red, orange, that's dawn and dusk. And so, so blue and green light send a daytime signal. White has it in there, has all the colors in there. And we have, and that's the issue with with some of the, the over bright lights. I mean, people talk about screens. I mean, the screens might be too small unless they're really holding it close to your face to really be more of a light issue. Screens are more of a mental activation issue, I think. But the overhead lights are pretty bright. 
start to hotel rooms are great at, at at few things except having relatively dim lamps in the evening and you can shut things down and so like that's a very good environment an hour before going to bed is sending that nighttime signal slowing the the light down slowing down the conversation and and it helps create that that signal blue blocking glasses can be great for that too because they're blocking out that that frequency and you know that they're whether they're cheap or expensive, you know they're good. If you put them on and you can't see the color blue, they're working. If you put them on and you can see things that are blue and they look blue, they're not working. Um, that's, that's a good way to tell. Well, thank you so much. This was such an incredible conversation. Uh, we appreciated having you. Um, thank you for fitting so many topics into one short hour. <laughs> no, no, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Wow, how great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training, and we'll see you back next week.